Hi y'all, and welcome to Professor True Love's Concepts for Nurses series. I am Professor Terry True Love, and in this episode we will be looking at atrial rhythms, part one, where we will review premature atrial complexes, atrial and supraventricular tachycardias, and wandering atrial pacemakers. This is part of the Cardiac Nursing series. Sources for this episode include Cone's Flip and See ECG, 4th edition. Atrial arrhythmias are the most common cardiac rhythm disturbances and result from impulses originating in areas outside of the sinoatrial node but within the atria. These arrhythmias can affect ventricular filling time and diminish the strength of atrial kick, a contraction that normally provides the ventricles with about 15 to 25 percent of their total blood volume. Causes of atrial dysrhythmias include enhanced automaticity, reentry, and triggered activity. With enhanced automaticity, atrial fibers can trigger abnormal impulses. Causes of increased automaticity include extracellular factors such as hypoxia, acidosis, hypocalcemia, and digoxin toxicity, and conditions in which the function of the heart's normal pacemaker, the SA node, is diminished. For example, increased vagal tone or hypokalemia can increase the refractory period of the SA node and allow for atrial fibers to fire impulse. In reentry, an impulse is delayed along a slow conduction pathway. Despite the delay, the impulse remains active enough to produce another impulse during myocardial repolarization. Reentry may occur with coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, or myocardial infarction. Triggered activity is when an injured cell sometimes only partly repolarizes. Partial repolarization can lead to repetitive ectopic firing called trigger activity. The depolarization produced by triggered activity is known as after depolarization and can lead to atrial or ventricular tachycardia. After depolarization can occur with cell injury, digoxin toxicity, and other conditions. Let's look at each arrhythmia in detail. First up are premature atrial complexes, or PACs. These originate outside the SA node and usually result from an irritable spot or focus in the atria that takes over as pacemaker for one or more beats. The SA node fires an impulse, but then an irritable focus bucks in, jumps in, firing its own impulse before the SA node can fire again. And we have an example of that here. PACs commonly occur with normal heart rate and rhythms and can be triggered by alcohol, nicotine, anxiety, fatigue, fever, and infectious disease. A patient who eliminates or controls those factors can also correct this arrhythmia. PACs may also be associated with coronary or valvular heart disease, acute respiratory failure, hypoxia, pulmonary disease, digoxin toxicity, and certain electrolyte imbalances. PACs are rarely dangerous in a patient who doesn't have heart disease. In fact, they commonly cause no symptoms and can go unrecognized for years. The patient may perceive PACs as normal palpitations or even skipped beats. However, in patients with heart disease, PACs may lead to more serious arrhythmias, such as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. In a patient with an acute MI, PACs can serve as an early sign of heart failure or an electrolyte imbalance. PACs can also result from a release of a neurohormone catecholamine during episodes of pain or anxiety. As you review your rhythm strip, you should learn how to ID the PAC. The hallmark EKG characteristic of a PAC is a premature P wave with an abnormal configuration when compared with the sinus P wave. When the PAC is conducted, the QRS complex appears similar to the underlying QRS complex. PACs are commonly followed by a pause. The PAC depolarizes the SA node early, causing it to reset itself and disrupt the normal cycle. When examining a PAC on an EKG, look for irregular atrial and ventricular rates. 
the underlying rhythm is usually regular. An irregular rhythm results from the PAC and its corresponding pause. The P wave is premature and abnormally shaped and may be lost in the previous T wave, distorting that wave's configuration. That is, the T wave might be bigger or have an extra bump. Varying configurations of the P wave indicate more than one ectopic site. The PR interval can be normal, shortened, or slightly prolonged, depending on the origin of the ectopic focus. If no QRS complex follows the premature P wave, a non-conducted PAC has occurred. PACs may occur in bigeminy, that is, every other beat is a PAC, trigeminy, every third beat is a PAC, or couplets, that is, two PACs in a row. The patient may have an irregular peripheral or apical pulse rhythm when the PACs occur. They may complain of palpitations, skip beats, or a fluttering sensation. Most patients who are asymptomatic won't need treatment. In symptomatic patients, however, treatment may focus on eliminating the cause, such as caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. When caring for a patient with PACs, assess that patient to help determine what's triggering the ectopic beats. Tailor the patient's teaching to help the patient correct or avoid the underlying cause. For example, if applicable, the patient should eliminate caffeine or nicotine or learn stress reduction techniques to lessen anxiety. If the patient has ischemic or valvular heart disease, monitor the patient for signs and symptoms of heart failure, electrolyte imbalances, and the development of more severe atrial arrhythmias. One of those more serious rhythms include atrial tachycardia, or AT. Atrial tachycardia is a supraventricular tachycardia, which means the impulses driving the rapid rhythm originate somewhere above the ventricles. Atrial tachycardia has an atrial rate from 150 to 250 beats per minute. This rapid rate shortens diastole, resulting in a loss of atrial kick, reduced cardiac output, reduced coronary perfusion, and ischemic myocardial changes. There are three types of atrial tachycardia. Atrial tachycardia with block, multifocal atrial tachycardia, or MAT, and paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, or PAT. Atrial tachycardia can occur in patients with normal, healthy hearts. In those cases, the condition is commonly related to excessive use of caffeine or other stimulants. Marijuana use, electrolyte imbalances, hypoxia, hypoxia, and physical or psychological stress. However, this arrhythmia is usually associated with primary or secondary cardiac problems. Cardiac conditions that can cause atrial tachycardia include myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, congenital anomalies, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, and valvular heart disease. The rhythm may be a component of sick sinus syndrome. Other problems that can result in atrial tachycardia include core pulmonal, hyperthyroidism, systemic hypertension, and digoxin toxicity. Digoxin toxicity is the most common cause of atrial tachycardia. It is important for the nurse to determine if the atrial tachycardia is benign or an ominous sign. This rhythm may be a forerunner of a more serious ventricular arrhythmia, especially if it occurs in a patient with an underlying heart condition. The increased ventricular rate of atrial tachycardia results in the decrease in time allowed for the ventricle to fill an increase in myocardial oxygen consumption, and a decrease in oxygen supply. Angina, heart failure, ischemic myocardial changes, and even a myocardial infarction can occur as a result. It is important that you properly identify atrial tachycardia, which is characterized by three or more successive ectopic atrial beats at a rate of 150 to 250 beats per minute. The P wave is usually upright, if visible, and followed by a QRS complex. Atrial and ventricular rhythms are regular. Keep in mind that atrial beats may be conducted on a one-to-one -one basis into the ventricles, meaning that each P wave has a QRS complex, so atrial and ventricular rates will be equal. In other cases, however, atrial beats may be conducted only periodically, meaning the AV conduction system is blocked. The block keeps the ventricles from receiving every impulse. When assessing the rhythm strip for atrial tachycardia, you will see that the atrial rhythm is always regular 
and ventricular rhythm is regular when the block is constant and irregular when it is not. It may be difficult to discern a P wave because of the rapid rate and the P wave may be hidden in the previous ST segment or T wave. Therefore, you may not be able to measure the PR interval if the P wave can't properly be distinguished from the preceding T wave. Interventions for atrial tachycardia depend on the type of atrial tachycardia, the width of the QRS complex, and the clinical stability of the patient. Remember that digoxin toxicity is a common cause of atrial tachycardia, so assessing the patient for signs and symptoms of digoxin toxicity and monitoring serum digoxin levels is important. Valsalva's maneuver or carotid sinus massage may be used to treat atrial tachycardia. Ironically, drug therapy used may include digoxin, unless of course the patient is ditch toxic, beta adrenergic blockers, and calcium channel blockers. When other treatments fail, or if the patient is clinically unstable, synchronized cardioversion may be used. Atrial overdrive pacing may also be used to stop the arrhythmia. This treatment helps suppress the depolarization of the ectopic pacemaker and permits the SA node to resume its normal role. In times that it is impossible or the provider is unable to discern a P wave, it is most proper to call these kind of rhythms a supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular simply means that the origin of the impulse exists somewhere above the ventricles. So, by definition, atrial tachycardias and even sinus tachycardias are by definition supraventricular tachycardias. However, we do reserve the term supraventricular tachycardia to a rhythm in which we cannot discern the actual source of the tachycardia. Rapid stimulation of the atrial tissue occurs at a rate of 100 to 280 beats per minute with a mean of about 170 beats per minute. Because the impulse travels down the normal pathways, the QRS is narrow. Because the rate is so fast, it is difficult, if not impossible, to differentiate the P wave. Because it is difficult to differentiate the P wave, it is improper to label this as a sinus rhythm or an atrial rhythm. Paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, or PSVT, is intermittent and it terminates suddenly with or without an intervention. Supraventricular tachycardias are usually treated because of the fast heart rate they are generally causing symptoms to the patient. Supraventricular tachycardia is treated according to adult cardiac life support protocols, and the treatment generally involves cardioversion or overdrive pacemaking. This strip gives us an example of a wandering atrial pacemaker. Notice the different configurations of the P wave on this strip. In some cases, such as in the left side, they are upward deflecting, while as you get to the right, they start to deflect downward. The wandering atrial pacemaker is an irregular rhythm the results when the heart's pacemaker changes its focus from the SA node to another area above the ventricles. The origin of the impulse may wander beat to beat from the SA node or to other atrial sites or to the AV junction. The P wave and PR interval vary from beat to beat if the pacemaker sites changes. This may happen because of increased vagal tone, digoxin toxicity, organic heart disease such as rheumatic carditis. It may be normal in young patients and is common in athletes who have slow heart rate. It may be difficult to identify because the arrhythmia is commonly transient. Although a wandering pacemaker is rarely serious, chronic arrhythmias are a sign of heart disease and should be monitored. Even something as innocent as a wandering pacemaker is problematic if the patient is symptomatic. On your EKG strip, look for slightly irregular beats because the sites of the impulse initiation vary. The rate is usually normal, that is between 60 and 100 beats per minute, but it may be slower. The P waves change shape as the pacemaker site changes. The impulses may originate in the SA node, the atria, or the AV junction. 
If an impulse originates in the AV junction, the P wave may come before, during, or after the QRS complex. The R to R interval will also vary from beat to beat as the pacemaker site changes, but it will always be less than 0 0.20 seconds. Variation in the PR interval will cause a slightly irregular R to R interval. If the impulse originates in the AV junction, the PR interval will be less than 0 0.12 seconds. Ventricular depolarization is normal, so the QRS complex will be less than 0 0.12 seconds. The T wave and the QT interval will usually be normal, although the QT interval can vary. As for interventions, usually no treatment is needed. If, however, the patient is symptomatic, the underlying cause should be treated. Monitor the patient's heart rhythm and assess for signs of hemodynamic instability. Also assess blood pressure, mental status, and skin color. Always monitor the patient, even if they do not currently have symptoms. The patient suffering from these type of atrial arrhythmias can either be asymptomatic or be at risk for significantly more dangerous dysrhythmias. That does conclude this episode of Cardiac Dysrhythmias, but wait, there's still another episode, part two of Atrial Dysrhythmias. I hope you learned something today. I hope you come back, and if you do, we'll see you then.